Can I do the thing? Can I just go live? I think I've gone live now. I think it's working this time. Is it going to give me a nice crisp HD video though? I don't think I set that on. It says I'm now live. There's a picture of me, but is Facebook going to display this? That's the question right there. Oh no, it actually shows me live. That's cool. I think I click this play button. Oh, and it's showing me live and the video is crisp. Oh, so nice. I've been fiddling with uh, Restream for the last 10 minutes or so. Restream's the thing I use to, um, hold on, I just want to make sure I do this. Get this nice and big so I can see any comments that come through. Turn the volume up. Make sure uh, I see at least one person watching. Can you just drop me a comment? Let me know if you can hear me. I'm dealing with all kinds of gremlins it's been a little bit since um, since I've done a live, actually, it turns out. Let's do some live tea pouring here. Here we go. It's happening. Oh, I just poured some tea live on my pants. <laughs> That's what happens with a live show. Things happen in the moment, and you can't do too much about it. It looks like we're getting um, uh, uh, captions. What if I turn the volume up? Does that work? That's interesting. It's not showing audio. Hey viewer, help me out. Are you getting my audio? Because I can't hear. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but it's actually turning the captions into something. So that's very confusing to me. It's been quite a morning, it turns out. That's shown blue, yeah. Okay, you can, hey Nuno, thank you. That's excellent. I've been trying to get Restream to work. Restream's the service that sends audio out, audio and video to a whole bunch of different, um, services so that I can stream to YouTube or, um, you know, whatever, whatever the other stuff is. Now Facebook's asking me to set my current frame rate to 15 to 60. Well, I've got it set super high. Hello from Ireland. You know, how did you end up getting to Ireland? I would like to know um, what, what was the journey that led you there? Because I believe you're Latinx. Is that right? You must have an interesting story. Um, I have no idea how I meant. Oh, settings. Is that where I set my stream? Where do I set my settings here? Get that uh, FPS up high. Well, eh, that's no help at all. It wants me to put it higher. How do you do that? Can you do that for me, Facebook? Whatever. We're just going to go live. We're just going to talk about the stuff that we're here to talk about. If this live sucks, it sucks. That's the way it goes. I'm fresh back from uh, Quebec and North Carolina. Boy, flying is a mess right now. And it's really interesting um, as you cross the border from a Canadian airport into an American airport, you notice, or at least I noticed very quickly, uh, a shift in the way people are wearing masks. So most Canadian airports, everyone's got their mask. I mean, there's lots of signs everywhere in both airports saying, please wear a face covering that covers your nose, your mouth, your chin. Um, and in the Canadian airports, for the most part, that's what you see is just a lot of people wearing masks covering their full face. And then as soon as you cross the border, we were in both Newark and um, a couple of air, uh, airports, Raleigh, Newark, and I think maybe, uh, I can't remember, but another one. Oh, JFK, I think. And uh, the the variety of ways people are wearing their masks is vastly different. And... I think this is in part, there's a whole bunch of reasons that people have, right? Mask mandates are stupid. Uh, masks don't work anyhow. That's that's kind of beside the point, though, because what's being asked of us based on the mandate, the bylaw is do this, please do this. And so the, the thing that I get curious about when I see this, I'm like, well, I wonder what the being, what's the belief underneath that's driving this behavior? And one of the things I notice about um, the American culture is it's very strong individual in individuality, very strong individualistic culture, which like any particular way of being or any particular belief set has great strengths to it. And some of those great strengths are that um, most American people have a really, um, there's a lot of good entrepreneurialism and kind of like, hey, let's take this on. Let's, 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 I'm going to do this myself. So strong individualism. Um, whereas in Canada, we'd have much, uh, I would say at least based on my observation, more of a, a bit more collective unity. So there's a little less me and a little more we. 
And those things are good and bad. There's no right or wrong to them or better or worse. It's not like the Canadian way is better than the American way, just that there's strengths and weaknesses. There's benefits and consequences to any particular belief that we can have. We'll be talking more about this today as we get into our limiting beliefs. So for something like a mandate that's designed to keep us all safe and the idea, I would assert, of like, hey, please do this, is can we all agree to do something for the collective benefit? And in American airports, I was really present to this strong individualism, sort of like, um, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I feel is best. And north of the border, there's a lot less of that particular attitude and a little more of us saying, um, OK, that's what we're being told to do. So that's what we're going to do. Now, you could you could frame that any number of ways, right? You could say, oh, Canadians are really obedient. Um, or as Carrie said, you could say Americans are selfish. I don't think either of those are very helpful ways of labeling something because um, the whole approach we take to leadership here is that underneath everything is the light and it's the light that gets, um, that ends up creating whatever patterns happening on top. So I don't, I don't think that Americans are selfish any more than other cultures are selfish in their own ways. Canadians are selfish too. So are Singaporeans, or I don't know the demonym for that. So are Japanese. So are every culture has its own ways of being selfish and self-interested. It just shows up differently on the surface. And as soon as we start to throw labels like they're selfish or up in Canada, they're a bunch of compliers, we miss out on all the richness that's available. And we miss out on the opportunity to see like, what's actually driving this behavior? Like if I held it with reverence, if I held it with compassion and grace and really sort of like let myself get beyond the easy dismissing of an entire population or even just an individual and got really curious about what's going on there, there's some real richness that can come forward. And from that place, we can really start to create leadership. So um, I think it's really just individualism and we are seeing in the wake of something that really demands some collective action, we're seeing the, the weakness of individualism. Um, and, you know, if you look to countries like uh, countries where they have a high, really high collective unity, so that would be like Japan or uh, China, I think I'm a little ignorant of these, but like those countries have a very high degree of like, we do what the group does, the individual is almost non existent. They're doing much better with things like mandates, vaccinations, that sort of thing. At least in terms of people choosing into the things that are available for the group. So traveling has been an interesting thing, a bit of a culture shock to leave our bubble here in Victoria, Canada, and then go somewhere else and be like, oh, things are different. Um, anyhow, enough of that. That can start to get unpleasant if we stay there too long. It's good to be home and it's nice to do a live. Uh, hey, Sharifat, I'm happy to hear from you too. It's, it's felt like a long time that we've been gone and I really missed doing these live videos. So I'm excited to uh, dive into the topics we have. Uh, I feel like I could talk forever about all this stuff. And I've got a dentist appointment that I'm on my way to because what happened is I've got a, a filling in this tooth over here. And the filling they did, they didn't correctly like grind it down. So it was like, it had a little ledge to it, the filling. And as a result, it would shred my floss, which is really annoying. I don't know if you floss, but when floss gets caught in your teeth, it's infuriating. And so when that happens, I become like the Hulk. I'm like, ah, fuck you, floss. You have one job. It's just to go up and come down. You're doing it poorly. And so I was doing that, and I flossed my filling off. So I've got this big gap I can fill in my tooth right now. There's no pain, fortunately. Um, but uh, I've got to go to the dentist at 10 to get that refilled. And so we're jumping on earlier this morning so that we can still have this conversation and be with each other. All right. Well, I've got lots to talk about. Let's see where we're going to start. Um, we're going to start with uh, a question we got from Vicky. Vicky, thank you so much for your question. Oh, before I dive into that, I just want to read what you wrote, N Nuno. Uh, your Portuguese. Ah, what did I? Uh, Gaijo Porero? Is that what it was? I The guys in Portugal were telling me how to um, how to say what's up, cool guy. I think it was Gaijo Porero. 
so Nuno, your Portuguese visitor friend for coffee 15 years ago and stayed here, being a great country for you. Wow, that's a cool story. I would love to hear more about that at some point. Hey, Andrew, good to see you. Thank you. This is, uh, this is from Montreal. Montreal has a bunch of really stylish, cool stuff. I wasn't aware of how, um, of our like, uh, I guess our Canadian kind of um, style. I know Vancouver and Vancouver has higher end stuff available, but it doesn't occur to me like a Mecca of fashion. You know, there's not, I, I've, when I go there, I'm like, okay, I'm buying stuff from the stores that are, you know, just higher end and bringing products in from elsewhere in the world. Whereas in Montreal, I really had this experience of a lot of like local stuff that's really stylish and cool and has its own culture. La mode, as they'd say. Gajo Porero. There it is. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and good to see you, Maximilian. Thanks for dropping in. So let's let's get on to what Vicky's asked here to start us off. Um, Vicky says, I would love to hear about how to deal with feeling like I've taken a few steps backwards sometimes. And why does it become an opportunity for beating myself up rather than loving myself through it? She has more that I'm going to speak to, but first we're going to touch on what she's just said there. So the desire for growth, and I'm going to say something we all know first, so we're all clear on this. There's not going to be anything surprising about what I'm about to say. Um, we, our desire for growth is that it goes like this, right? Like a straight line up. Then the um, popular wisdom about growth is that it's two steps forward, one step backwards. And so we're like, okay, two steps forward, one step backwards. I can kind of like get to that in my head, intellectual, I can appreciate that, I can understand that, I'm gonna get on board with that, all right. My experience of how growth actually goes though is more like two steps forward, four steps backwards, seven steps forward, one step backward, one step forward, one step backward, one step forward, one step backward, two steps forward, one step backward, four steps forward, two steps backward. So it's not even consistent in its inconsistency which would make it way easier. If it was just two, one, two, one, we could kind of like settle into that rhythm and be like, okay, I can see this is the part of the backswing. I know I just have to wait this out and trust myself and things will go forward. But instead it's much more zigzaggy than that. And that makes it even harder for us to be with. So that's an important um, point to make here is um, that's just a natural part of the process. We know that, but it's the fact that it's inconsistently inconsistent that makes it even harder for us to be with. Why does it become an opportunity to beat yourself up rather than loving yourself through it? The answer to that, Vicky, is because that's what you learned and because um, there was some payoff and remains some kind of payoff to doing that. So why why do we beat ourselves up? Like if if I don't succeed at my goal, thanks, Sarah, if I don't succeed at my goal, why don't I just love myself and tell myself it's okay instead of berating myself and like feeling like I'm going to fail at life and I'm never going to do what I want to do and all of that stuff. The, the reasons are always like, they're really fascinating for us to get excited by, to, to be like, I'm going to learn all about that. And then we go to our coach and we're like, tell me all about that. And can we explore this? And can we really pull this out of the ground? But the answer is often very simple. And the answer is usually one, because that's what our parents taught us. When we were growing up, our parents brought us rigor in times when maybe we would have benefited more from love. And the reason they did that was not because they're jerks. It's because that's what they were brought by their parents. And that's what they were brought by their parents and their parents and their parents and so on and so forth, all the way up the chain. And then we unconsciously deliver that to our children. That's just the way it goes. So we could look into like, why did my dad do that, blah, 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 and create all these fascinating psychological systems and rules and talk about family dynamics and constellations and blah, blah, blah. But the beautiful part about coaching is we don't have to worry about that. We're just like, okay, you came by this honestly. Second, the reason you continue to do it is because there's some benefit to it, some kind of payoff, even if it doesn't occur like one. So the payoff might be that you learned if you're kind of in a slump and you pull out the whip and smack yourself across the back, you're going to speed up. You're going to start doing more stuff. And that's okay. That in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It becomes problematic when it's automatic, when you have no other choice but your default. Because there are going to be times when 
I don't want to say, be hey, Heather, nice to see you. Good evening. There are going to be times, I, I wouldn't say like being vicious and berating yourself and kind of being internally abusive to yourself. That's not really ever going to be helpful. But all of this exists on a spectrum. And Vicky, to your question, there are going to be times when um, instead of beating yourself up, you're just kind of doing that thing that some of us can do where you're like, come on, come on, Vicky, get back on the horse. You know, so more rigorous with yourself rather than more loving. And that can really serve us sometimes. There are times when we fall off the horse that what's called for is to just get right back on it, even though our body's aching. And then there are other times when what's called for is to like, be like, you don't have to get back on the horse, my love. I'm going to just lay here and let my body ache. So um, that's why you do it. There's some kind of payoff to it. It works to some extent. And then the second part of what Vicky's asking is, you know, I create all this space and all this love and acceptance and curiosity. And then something comes and boom, I feel like I'm operating out of bubbling anger, judgment and frustration again. And the last thing I really want to do is get curious about the other side in the moment. So there's a bit of a trap here. And the trap is our belief, which often can become like a conviction that if I did all the work, I would not have anger. I would not get righteous. I would not be frustrated and annoyed and have judgment and, and anger with other people. But that misses the point of transformation entirely. What you'd be doing then is really severing a part of your humanity. This, by the way, is what a lot of marketing and especially coaching, leadership, transformational marketing is trying to sell you. It's selling you this idea that you can move or get yourself to a place where you won't be afraid anymore. It's selling you this idea that you can get to a place where you won't be angry with people ever again. And you can even see this like coaches do this often, not maliciously, not because they're trying to fish hook you and get you as a client, but because they think that's how they're supposed to be. So the, the, the way that kind of copy gets written is it's sort of like, it, it's quite predictable. Start with like, here's how I used to be. And then the story of how they used to be was like, I would get angry at everyone and I hated their stupid face. I was mad and I was lonely. Here's how I now am. So, right, it's like the before and the after. Now, I love people exactly as they are and I don't need them to be any different. So I would say what's really happening in that person's, the arc of the story they're selling us is that they used to have all this anger just boiling over and they didn't have any capacity to really be with it. It just sort of spewed off them and landed square on your face. And then they've shifted from there to suppressing all that anger. So now they're either internalizing it, so they're directing it inwards at themselves rather than get it on other people, or they're just trying to push it below the level of their own consciousness. They're probably like doing a bunch of rationalizing and intellectualizing. I, I'm angry. I know I don't need to be angry. I know that this is really just about me. I know that I know that I know that. So that's not the point of transformation. That's missing out on transformation entirely. All that's doing is escaping up into our mind and trying to think away the reality of the moment. I'm not going to tell you what transformation is about, but I want to let that sink in while I take a sip of tea. Anytime we start to do that sort of overthinking, rationalizing away our anger or judgment or whatever, it's not helpful. In fact, it's often harmful because what that ends up doing is it hides, it moves your anger out of your own awareness. And then you end up being completely oblivious to when you're angry. And then it, it ends up, it's sort of like a, it's like a bull in a china shop. We have no control over it at that point because we have no consciousness of it. We can't, we can't be in control of that which we are not conscious of. So what we do as we become transformed, as we step further into transformational work, as we, as we become more of a leader, it's not that we don't get angry. In fact, you'll probably notice more of your own anger for a few reasons. One, because you're gonna start to be less protected as you show up in the world. And the less protected you are, the more the world can impact you. And the more the world can impact you, the more sometimes it's gonna drive up your anger. You know, your fear is going to get hit and then your righteousness is going to get poked by that. And then your anger is going to show up on top of that. No, just me. Okay. That's how it looks for me. So from there, 
we're going to we're going to be more open and that's going to let us get impacted more which is going to drive more anger two we're going to be practicing being more consciousness uh, more conscious either one works so as you open more as you transform more and step more into transformational work you're naturally going to become more conscious of what's going on inside of you and so inevitably you're going to start to notice more of your own anger be like wow shit there's a bunch of this here especially if you've been repressing it all of these years if you've been shutting it down as an aside often those when those coaches that write that kind of copy start to come and work with me one of the early things there is for them to for me to reflect to them and them to kind of um, come to terms with is the anger they have. And they have a lot of resistance to it because they're selling this story to themselves and to everyone else. Well, I used to be angry, but I'm not angry anymore. And and my job's to kind of like love them and be like, you're seething. <laughs> you seem incredibly angry. You're just talking through it. You're making it sound really nice, but you sound really pissed. That's a bit of a reckoning, a point of reckoning for them to to come to awareness of that. So we become more conscious and that has us start to be present to more anger here. And finally, we become more present to everyone else's anger as it's showing up, everyone else's judgment, because again, we're open to more. And the world is awash with the abundance of all of the human experience. So as you open yourself more and become more conscious, you're gonna get to taste the richness of love and of joy and of and of companionship and connection much more deeply. But you're also in that elixir, you're also gonna get all the anger and the judgment and everything else that comes with that. You can't love someone, but only part of them. To expand our hearts and to really open ourselves up to love and to bring people on board means we accept all of them. And so that means that you're gonna be present to more anger, more of that. So what a leader does with their anger is not not have it, not do really good so that they don't get angry. They are simply more conscious of their anger as it arises and then more responsible for its impact. And what that means is that when I get angry, I, I can be responsible for it. I can acknowledge like, oh, I'm angry right now. And from there, rather than jumping straight to replying to the email and shooting a shot across the bow of the person that drove up my anger, I have a little more space to be like, oh, I'm angry. I want to hurt this person right now. Now is not the time for me to write this email. I'm going to take a moment. And if I take that moment and I recognize I'm still angry, rather than make myself wrong for that, rather than hold this expectation like I shouldn't be angry, instead, I have the capacity to be like, okay, I'm still angry. I need to move this energy. This anger needs to be expressed. I'm going to go punch the pillows in my bedroom, or I'm going to hold a pillow over my head and scream. I'm going to actually move this energy through my body. I'm going to allow it to be experienced and expressed in a responsible way. So what most people are doing is their anger shows up. They're not even really conscious of it because they're trying to tell themselves they're not angry or whatever. And then they just immediately react from their anger and punch the person in the face, either physically, literally, or metaphorically and figuratively send that nasty email, write that nasty comment on Facebook, shoot off that nasty Twitter response, write a, you know, a polemic about this company that did you wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the work of taking on things like our judgment, our anger, and our frustration. It's not that we don't have them. It's not that growth means you have less anger. It, there is something that changes, and I'll talk about that in a sec, but it's that you become more willing to allow your anger and the anger of everyone else to exist within you, and you become more responsible for its impact. The other side of our responsibility is noticing when we did cause a mess, when we did shoot an email over at someone and it landed kind of mean because that's how we were intending in the moment, we reach back out to them and we say, hey, I'm really sorry. I realized I was angry. I was hurt. And that email wasn't really my best art. And I imagine it might have made a bit of a mess with you. Is there anything I need to clean up? I'm really sorry. That's how we be responsible for it. <laughs> Andrew sharing, I'm just listening today as I got both boys at home today. Had to comment though, I taught my boys the yelling in the pillow technique. It's been quite amusing to watch. So Adam, your influence is reaching the youth now. <laughs> we're going viral. If we're getting to the young uns, we're going viral. That's that's an amazing practice to offer your kids, Andrew. I really love that. Um, 
does it move the energy through their body? I'm curious if that actually like shifts the energy through their body, has the has things go differently for them if it sort of allows them to get some of that out. It sure makes a difference for me. And most of us are resistant to taking that on. We feel silly yelling into a pillow. We feel stupid and we feel like we shouldn't have to do it. There's no have to or don't have to in this. There's just, hey, what's true for me in this moment? Oh, I'm angry. Okay, what, what would being angry do in a responsible way? Meaning in a way that doesn't harm other people, in a way that is conscious of what's around me, but still honors what's actually here. Um, what does tend to change as you step further into transformation, as you take on more of your own work, is that your anger moves through you more quickly. And that's not, so, so what ends up happening is, happening, that's what I said. What ends up happening or what you end up having, and that was the two words I smashed together at that intersection there, is that because you're less resistant to the idea of just anger, you're able to be with it sooner. And because you're able to be with it sooner, you're not holding it at bay. And as a result, you can move it, you can allow it to exist, and you can let it move through your body. And then it, it exits, it leaves you, just like every other feeling. If we can fully embrace whatever there is to feel, it moves through us. And then the next emotion shows up. It's like, now you're sad and you let yourself feel sad. And then now you're elated. Now you're happy. Now you're excited. Now you're bored, whatever. And so the irony is that on this initial side, we we're kind of like, we want, we're like, I will be with anger so that it goes away. And then what happens is you start to learn to be with anger simply because it's there not to make it go anywhere, not to have it stay with you or leave or anything, but just like, I'm going to be angry in this moment because what's true is that I'm angry in this moment. I'm going to stop resisting reality. And as you start to do that, not to make it go away, not with an agenda, but just so that you can be more in alignment with what's real for you, with what's true for you. On the other side of that willingness to just be with who you be in the moment, that stuff moves through us faster, faster. So by letting go of the need for our anger to go away, ironically, it tends to move through us faster. So that's my thoughts on what you've written there, Vicki. It's a really great um, place to be. By the way, Vicki says, you know, the last thing I really want to do is get curious about the other side in the moment. You don't need to. And in fact, most people, when they're hurt, especially coaches, I see this a lot. I'm curious becomes the start of a really shitty thing people are about to say. So you'll say something, hey, Vicky, they'll say something and it drives up our anger. And then we are like, I shouldn't be angry. I should be curious. And then what we're ending up doing is we're asking, we're trying to be curious over top of the fact that we're angry. So we'll be like, I'm curious why you thought that would be a good question, which, and the, un, the subtext of that is, I'm curious why you're so fucking stupid and thought that would be a good thing to ask me right now, dummy, fuck face. That's what's really getting conveyed because we're not being responsible for our anger. So when I'm angry, that's not a good time for curiosity. When I'm angry, that's a time to be angry responsibly. So, oh, I don't have the capacity to get over there with the other side right now. I'm up in my own stuff. I gotta honor that. I'm gonna excuse myself. Can you bear with me? Can you give me a moment? I'm gonna go take care of something. I got some anger. I just need to move it through my body. Nothing to do with you. It's all good. Come back, flushed. Now I could be curious, maybe. But the idea that we should just not have anger and then always be curious about the other side is inhuman. And it's um, it's part of the toxicity that can get bred when people have a little bit of coaching training, a little bit of transformational training but don't stay in that work because then they never get to this point where it's like, oh, the deeper work is to honor what's actually here, to let that exist, especially when it's hard. Because most of us don't like the idea that we're angry. We don't really want to give that any face time because we hold that it's wrong. So we're like, I don't want to, I don't want to engage with that. No, sir. That's the hard part about being responsible. All right. Um, what else do we have that I like to talk about? Uh, Ernest asks a question. Um, thanks for your question, Ernest. He says, how can you or a client embody a way of being you have little context for? For example, I want to be more assertive at work, 
which then maybe turns into I'm the kind of person that doesn't retreat from a tough conversation, which maybe turns into I'm a stand for making everyone feel heard. You could imagine what that may be like, but if you've never done or been it, how would you know if you're doing or being it? So Ernest is kind of asking like, let's say I'm standing for something and I think I'm doing it, but then I, I don't like, I've never gone through it myself. And so how do I know if I'm actually doing it or am I just fooling myself? How do you become something that doesn't exist yet in your mind as an experienced concept? Uh, so let's see, I, I haven't thought about this question. I'm just sort of being with it in this moment. My first thought would be, well, how do you, how do you play soccer if you've never played soccer? How, what do you do? We do a couple of things, right? One is we watch people play soccer and we're like, oh, I guess that's how you play soccer. We might learn about the rules for playing soccer just so that we have some of it. But there is a point where just learning about the rules is going to become a hindrance. So we, we might read about them, but then there's a point where we have to step on the field. And we might seek out a coach who can help us work with that. So the first thing is, how do you embody a way of being your little context for hire a coach? You know, that's that's part of it. And hire a coach that can embody this way of being. This is why coaches need to continually be doing their work. I can't sit on my laurels and be like, I've arrived. Well, I guess I could. But then my clients and the people that come to me are going to get stalled. Often when um coaches are saying, I think I need, uh, I need to up-level the, the kind of clients I'm working with. It's not true. They need to up-level the coach they're working with. The client part will take care of itself. The clients that that coach is drawing to them are a reflection of where the coach themselves is stuck. It's very tempting to put it onto those people. Oh, the problem is the quality, the class, the level of commitment, the whatever that these people over here, I'm drawing to me, so I need to filter better. No, you need to up, up level the, the kind of work you're doing with your own coach. And that's going to then have you show up differently, which is going to bring different people to you. But so that's the first obvious answer, right? Like hire someone. That's the whole point of coaching. The second answer is to you practice. So how do we know if we're practicing something? We just give it a go. We do our very best. The third thing I want to point to is... The stand that Ernest has, has put forward here is a little bit, um, there's a lot to it. So I want to be more assertive at work. What is the way of being underneath that? What We could say maybe assertiveness. So what does that mean? Like, what does it actually mean to be absur assertive? Does it just mean that I just share what's on my mind? Whatever I'm feeling, I put that into the space? Or does it mean something different? Where I like to look for stands with people and to support people to create stands from is really fundamental, basic qualities of being. And the reason I like to do that is because it makes it easier to practice and it takes away a lot of the complexity that our brain tries to put into the space. So like, I am the kind of person that doesn't retreat from a tough conversation. Great, well, who do you wanna be? Like, who would you be being that would make that happen? And maybe it would be, excuse me, I'm just going to burp right into the mic. Goodness me. It's been a while since I've been live. Pardon me, guys. Who do I want to be that, um, that would have me not walk away from a tough conversation? Uh, I want to be bold. I'm going to practice being bold. And so... The nice thing about that stand is it makes it really simple. You know, when I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, what's the, you know, ah, oh, here's a situation. That person's saying something. I think it's kind of racist. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I think we should do something about that. And then we can go to our stand and be like, who am I committed to being? Bold. Great. What is there to do from being bold? And then there's no right answer, but it's a very simple calculus. You don't have to think like, well, is that the right reflection of being bold? I don't know. Just go and be bold. There's a million different options that are available. Step into being bold. When we have something like, I'm the kind of person that doesn't retreat from a tough conversation, there's a little more complexity to that. And so when that same thing is happening, we can start to be like, well, is this the tough conversation or is it a tough conversation over there with that person? How, what's the right way for me to have the tough conversation? How should I broach this? How do I do this? Is confronting the person the tough conversation or is that making it easy? You can see like it just adds all this complexity 
And our fear loves complexity because it slows down our action. It puts us into the illusion or the myth that we need to figure things out and get clarity before we act. And that then stops us acting. It allows us to hang out in our brain and our thinking about rather than the actual showing up into the world and getting on the court of our life and acting. Bay uh, described this recently in a forge call. She was talking about it like hanging out and furnishing the house in which we talk about doing the thing we want to do rather than going and doing the thing we want to do. So if this apartment, this room I'm in is like the room in which I think about the thing I want to do. I put more stuff on the walls and I wallpaper it and I make it look nice and I move a chair here and I, you know, I spend all my life there without ever actually getting out into my life and doing the thing I want to do. Let me have a sip and see if there's anything more. The, so that's the, 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 the simple answer for Ernest is like, there's a lot of trying to figure it out in Ernest's question. And um, what serves us much better is to practice and then to have support. The reason we have to practice is so that we're taking some action. Otherwise it's like, we're just sitting at a theoretical, like a blackboard writing theory up on it but we never really get into action. So we never know if our theory bears fruit. And then we're left thinking like, is this theory right or wrong? Maybe I'll need a second theory to test the theory of the first theory. And then I can figure out which theory is the great theory, blah, 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 blah. Go out into the world and practice. And the beauty of what a coaching relationship provides, like an ontological coaching relationship, a coaching relationship that is not about helping you make more money, or helping you make more business or helping you get fitter. I'm talking about like a coach coach. You know, you could call them life coach or ontological coach or transformational coach, that kind of coach who supports you in how you're being in every aspect of your life. The beauty about that kind of relationship is that they're, they're gonna be able to sit with you and support you to see, hey, how did that go? What was the impact of what I did? If I'm committed to being bold, did that lead to something? Did that move me more towards my commitment of being bold? And did it have the impact I wanted it to have? Well, I went up to that person, I talked to them and they spat on my face and that was the end of the conversation. Great, how do you want it to go differently next time? So the coach acts as someone that can support you to, to distinguish all this stuff. Oh, that definitely didn't create what I wanted. It turns out I don't just wanna be bold, I wanna be bold and I wanna, I wanna create a conversation rather than just shout, you're a jerk in someone's face. Okay, great. What do I need to do next time to, to have that go different? And then we come up with the next actions and then you go and practice again. So I would summarize Ernest's question a little bit with it being kind of, how do I know I'm doing it right? You know, you can imagine what it's like, but if you've never done or been it, how do I know if I'm doing or being it? How do I know if I'm doing it right? How do I know if I'm practicing right? You probably won't. That's the nature of leadership. Leadership exists out in the unknown where there we've not yet walked that path. And consequently, there isn't a right or a wrong. Right or wrong is just based on what's been done before and what we've decided is works. So the beauty of leadership is you can't do it right or wrong. The challenge is you can't do it right or wrong. So you don't have anything to go on. So we have to like, it requires some courage to be able to like put ourselves out there, kind of be a little bit like, uh, I'm going to take a shot and this may create the impact I don't want to have. And we have to be willing to do that, knowing we can clean it up so then we could come back, iterate again and continue to do our work. Andrew saying your response is really resonating, Adam. I will get caught in that mindset of quote unquote up leveling clients. So thanks for providing that context. It seems like a great topic to explore further for me. Yeah. There's no, um, there's no right or wrong. And a lot of the questions I often get, even from clients and probably that I bring to my coach, uh, if I am honest, a lot of our questions are like, am I doing it right? How do I know if I'm doing it right? How do I do it right? Most of us want to just know that we're doing it right before we take a swing, which kind of brings us to this notion of right action and right being. So anytime someone is committed, the, uh, hold on, let me just check and make sure I want to enter it this way. Um, 
right when I speak of right action, right being, I'm speaking of those terms like the, the word right in the Buddhist sense, right living. Right living in the Buddhist sense would often be like living in alignment with what you're on this planet to do. And there's no book you can go to seek that out. There's just an internal feeling you have. There's a there's a I've got a little fidget toy here. I keep dropping. It's this little ring that feels good against my fingers. That's why you see me dip down from time to time. Um, so it's not right in the sense that people agree with it or it's the correct thing to do or that you won't get in trouble as long as you do this or any of that. It's simply right. It's, it's a better word for it might be like aligned, aligned action and aligned being. But I like saying right because it kind of forces us to reconcile right and wrong. And it kind of provides a bit of a different lens for that word. So right action and right being are the two components required anytime someone wants to create a transformational result, any result, period, really. So when I'm working with someone and they're not getting the results that they want to get, the two places I'm looking are, are they in right action and are they in right being? Now I'm going to elaborate on what that means. Right action means, are they taking the actions required? Are they taking the actions aligned with generating the kind of result they're trying to create? Here's a simple example. This will require a bit of tea. In the coaching community, one of the places coaches get stuck early on is um, they are afraid to invite people into a coaching conversation. Would you like to have a coaching conversation around that? They're afraid to do that, you know, because it's scary. It's edgy. What if the person says no? And then that means that I'll never get any yeses. Oh my God, I can't do this thing that I really want to do. Uh, you know, all of that it's not necessarily true or even valid, but it's valid in the sense that it's their fear and our fear doesn't need to be rational. Our fear is just our fear. So a lot of coaches early on struggle. They get stuck asking people for a conversation, inviting someone to a coaching conversation. And so what's happened in the community is these um, things called challenges, 50 powerful conversation challenges. And the idea is the coach is given the challenge, go and invite, create 50 conversations. So like invite people as much as you need to do to create 50 conversations so that you get practice inviting people to conversations and that you create clients. So great practice, totally good. You know, practice out in the face of your fear. So the ultimate goal of this stuff is often to create clients and to confront the fear of inviting people you find scary into a coaching conversation. That's the result they're trying to create. Overcome my fear of inviting people and to create clients. What happens is a lot of these coaches turn around and make that offer to other coaches. So they're taking the action but they're doing so in such a way that it's not really going to be aligned with the results they want to create. They're asking people for which it's really safe to make that request because this person is a coach and they already know about coaching. So it's not so edgy and they're going to be more primed already to be a yes to me. And they're asking that coach because it's going to be safer and I don't have to worry and I don't have to feel so bad and blah, blah, blah. So this is an example where they're not in right action. The action they're taking kind of lets them meet the letter of the practice they've been given, but it's not going to generate, it's not commensurate with the results that they want to create. So when we talk about right action, that's one of the things I'm always looking in service of and with, and in partnership with my clients. Are they in the action required to generate the results? Or are they just completely stopped, not taking any action? Or are they taking action, but it's not really, it's sort of a, a circumventing kind of action. This is going to get me around having to do that stuff that's a little scary. So to create anything, we gotta be in right action. That's the first place we look. The second place is we need to be in right being. And right being really means, it, it's kind of two things. One, it's, am I being aligned with who I am innately? If part of who I am is playfulness and the way I'm showing up is that I've taken all my playfulness and dialed it way down and I'm trying to be very serious and operate over top of my natural playfulness. And I show up to you and I'm like, hello, my name is Adam. Would you like to have a coaching conversation? It'll be very powerful. 
that's going to feel off to you right out of the gate. It's going to feel super weird. And so, and yet that's what a lot of us try to do. We have a belief, a story that there's a right way I'm supposed to do something. There's a correct professional way you're meant to show up as opposed to like a way that's in alignment with who we are. So one, we've got to be in alignment with our being. I have to be aligned with what's innate for me. I can't pretend I'm not playful. At the same time, I can't go over the top and just be a clown, but that's that wouldn't really be in alignment with what's natural for me anyhow. And the second thing is, are we aligned with, like, is the way we're being commensurate to the way we would be being if we had already achieved this result? I'm gonna pull that apart a little bit because that might be a little more confusing. For coaches, they're often, they want to be at this place where they're in high demand, they're highly regarded, they're really professional. They're like, Adam, I know how valuable coaching is and yet people don't believe it's valuable. And from that set of fear and beliefs, the way they show up with people, the way they're being with those people is apologetic, obsequious, and willing to give, they'll give all of their time away for free. And the, the person is like, well, I only have time available at 11 at night on Wednesday. Can you make that work? And the coach is like, totally, I can make that work, right? So the coach is falling all over themselves to meet this person. That way of being is not really consistent or aligned with what they say they wanna create, which is like results and really hold that coaching powerful and valuable and that they're a business person and blah, 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 blah. Imagine a brain surgeon. Like imagine if you wrote to a brain surgeon and he was like, hey, you got a tumor. And you're like, okay, thanks for helping me see that. I'm, I'd like to have you operate on it. And they're like, great, here's when I'm available. And you're like, can't make any of those. Could you make 11 at night on a Wednesday? And they were like, yeah, yeah, I can totally make that. No problem at all. You'd be like, wait a sec, what the hell's going on here? What kind of brain surgeon is this? This is going to be a hack job. He's going to cut my brain open with a hacksaw. I don't want to have this guy work on me. So you can see the being of that is out of alignment with the results and the, the version of themselves they're hoping to be. So to create a particular set of results, we require right action and right being. And when those two things are present, the results happen. Maybe not immediately, but they happen. Tea time. Now here's the funny thing is that a lot of coaching, most coaching, the vast majority of coaching and the vast majority of leadership looks at one or the other of these. So a lot of work, a lot of coaching is facilitative, meaning it's entirely focused on the right action. Con consulting is almost entirely based in right action. Oh, you want to create more clients? Great. Let's have you do this, 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 this. You need to call 100 people every day. You need to ask them if they'd like your services. And when they say no, you need to double check. And then if they say yes, you need to do some spin selling. If you do that, you will create the money results, whatever, buy my funnels, you know, whatever. I'm being a little cheeky, but it's fun for me. So a lot of the work is focused entirely on right action. And what happens when we're only focused on right action is a little bit like, imagine we had two people that were salespeople for the same company. And the sales company brings in a consultant who's gonna sit down with them and he teaches them the guaranteed surefire, you don't need to worry about anything, this will create results approach to selling. So he gives it to them and it includes those steps I talked about. You're gonna have, now imagine that we have two salesmen and the first salesman calls these people and on each call, he's really clear on the value he's providing. He's clear that he's got something to offer that people may not yet be aware of and that may really change their life and their experience of life. And that he's clear like, it's okay if people don't want his business because there's an abundance in the world and some people do. So he doesn't need any one person. And that person from that way of being makes those calls. Now imagine our second salesman and their being, their beliefs and what they're operating from is they're a nuisance. They're interrupting people in the middle of something important. People don't want to talk to them. And he's not so sure he's going to be able to make this work. So it's really important that he figures out how to get them on the hook. So even if those two people do the exact same amount of action, the exact same consistent actions every step of the way, 
one person is in right being and the other person is not. And this person over here is going to generate results. And this person over here, in spite of all of the consulting, in spite of the greatest recipe in the entire world, is just not going to be able to create the results. So that's what happens when something's exclusively focused on action. The other side is when something's exclusively focused on being. That's where a lot of the, that's kind of like the next wave of coaching. The next wave of leadership is all focused in right being, and it puts very, very little attention on right action. The idea is sort of like, if we do enough work on your awareness and your being, you'll just naturally get into action. And what tends to happen there is that people never go and get their hands dirty. They just keep showing up with their coach and they have conversations like, I notice I have resistance to doing the thing. And I know we talked about this last week and I know we talked about this the week before. And now that resistance I notice is showing up is like where last week I just wasn't doing it. Now this week, it seems like, like I don't wanna do it. And when I think about it, it reminds me of the way I was being like when I was a kid and when my dad made me do stuff. And so maybe we could talk about that. And then this next gen, you know, next wave kind of coaching leadership, whatever. It's like, great, let's look at that. What does that mean to you, blah, 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 blah. So what happens down this path is endless conversation where nothing really ever happens. People never really move forward in their lives. They just keep having conversations about their lives. So it's only when we merge right action and right being together that results are created. We have to have both of those. That was a question from Maximilian was asking about right being. So I feel like I've said enough on that. I'm going to talk about feeling drained by your videos, your lives, and your webinars next. And then I'll talk about recognizing limiting beliefs. That'll probably take us through most of this. Um, so I was talking to someone yesterday uh, who was uh, wanted to know about working with me. And they... As we were talking, I was sharing some stuff, you know, this, here's some distinctions, here's some of what I do with people versus like what, you know, transformation distinct from growth, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but as we were talking, I noticed his face was totally flat. He's very stoic. And I was like, hmm, okay, very stoic. I wonder what's going on over there. So I asked him, I was like, hey, you know, I noticed your expression's very flat. I'm not really clear what's going on. And I'm wondering if this stuff's resonating or if you're just kind of tolerating me talking, waiting for me to finish or, so what's what's going on? That's what we do, by the way. Uh, in coaching and leadership, rather than make an assumption about what's happening over there and then trying to operate over top of that, like, oh, his face is very flat, which means he's not liking what I'm saying. So I'm going to be even more delightful and I'm going to, I'm going to bring even more value. That's how we tend to operate. That's what imposter syndrome ultimately is. We look out, we see a look on people's faces. Oh my God, they think I suck. And then we come over top of that belief. In coaching and leadership, we just ask. We ask the question. And what that requires is some courage on your part because you have to be willing for them to say, yeah, this is kind of boring. And you... You kind of need to develop the fortitude, which comes from working with your own coach and practicing to let people have whatever experience they're having without taking it personally, without it meaning anything. So I'm like, what's going on over there? You know, I can't, I notice I can't tell if you're enjoying this or if you hate my haircut or what's going on. And so uh, he said, well, you know, Adam, what it is, is I'm on video and Zoom all day long, which is interesting because he'd asked for Zoom with me. I'm on video and Zoom and webinars all day long and I'm putting on the show and it's exhausting. So that's what we're gonna talk about, this, this feeling of being exhausted. I'm just gonna read what you wrote here, Andrew, before I... Uh... I'm just gonna give everyone some dead air while I read your question. Uh, no, I'm not. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it right now. So Andrew writes, the one place I find this dynamic confusing is when it comes to connection. I understand that when, say, booking a sample coaching session, you want to stand for specific time slots rather than being ultra flexible. However, when it comes to a connection conversation, it feels like the embodiment of coach could actually get in the way of a connection conversation. Uh, I might have gotten a, law, a little lost there, Andrew, because you said the word connection a bunch. What, what do you mean? 
can you can you say that a little like in a single sentence, a little more clear, just so I can, you know, do my best to answer that. In the meantime, um, as we start to explore with this person, like, okay, well, tell me about this feeling of being drained and you know, to finish what he had said, actually, he was like, so, you know, when I can chill, I'm just going to chill. So I'm just letting myself kind of relax. I'm not putting on the thing right now. So I was asking like, well, what, you know, what is it you find draining about these conversations? And he's saying, well, I got to put on the show, you know, people aren't there for me to be boring. And what I talk about, no one wants to know about, it's not something they're interested in learning. So I got to, I got to jazz it up. I got to bring the excitement. So that's a really common thing. That's the experience. Like when you put a camera on people and what you're going to almost inevitably get back from that is people turning the volume up on whatever's innate for them. So if someone's witty, they're not just witty, they're fucking witty. And if they're like, um, if they're loving, they're not just going to be loving. They're going to be saccharine, sweet, loving, like the description of uh, our live today. So whatever's there, they they pour it on, they turn it way up. And that's not natural for us. That's coming over the top of what's innate for us. So again, remember when we talk about aligned with your being, there's a level of wit or authenticity or connection or love or whatever that's innate and embodied in you that you don't have to do anything to sort of express. It's just there to be expressed you're probably not aware of it. Like you probably don't have a good marker on it because you've been trained by the world around you and by yourself to show up a particular way in particular situations, like when there's a camera on you. And so for you, you start to relate to that as that's just the way I am when the camera's on me. I would assert, nah, not at all the case. In fact, your being is always available. That's just the way you've learned to be in those situations. What's going on with my feed? My feed's going wacky. Stop going wacky feed. I'm going to keep talking. Hopefully we're going to get through this. Have another sip of tea and I'm going to refresh this page. So we think that what's draining is the thing we're talking about or the situation we find ourselves in or the circumstance like, oh, being on camera is draining. But it's not. It's who we've learned to be that we find draining. It's the way we've decided we have to show up that leaves us draining. And so the beautiful thing about right being, okay, can you guys see my feed? It seems like it's, I don't know what's going on over here. Wow, crappy feed day, hey? We're all over the map. Oh, well, maybe we'll finish early if it's just getting, uh, I'll type this. Uh, are you guys still getting video? Um, so as we shift into the right being, as we start to become more aligned with ourselves, well, hold on. Before we go there, let's talk about the temptation. Okay, great. You can see it, Andrew. This is just on my side. That's great. Thank you. Um, the temptation in situations like this is, oh, on video, it's very draining for me. So I'm going to shift my business to all not video. Or I'm going to structure my business so I do video, and then I get an hour-long break to deal with the feeling of being drained, which is kind of like learning to manage the consequences of the strategy that you created in the first place. And so, uh, Tommy, thanks. Hey, Tommy, by the way. Yeah, it's it's really uh, cluttery and clumsy on my side. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe uh, wind or something like that. Can we blame it on the wind? Is that possible? Anyhow, my apologies. My connection looks really good. So I don't know what's happening. I'm going to take this scarf off now. It's getting a little warm. So. The opportunity is almost never, it's rarely to change our circumstances. We can do that and it is gonna provide us a reprieve for a while, but that's kind of like coming up with a new fix to the solution that didn't really need to be put in place to begin with. And so the opportunity when we notice ourselves being drained, finding ourselves exhausted in lives and webinars and such is to ask ourselves like what would really be authentic for me in this moment like if i didn't have to put anything on if i didn't have to put on airs or make people believe a certain thing about me or if i didn't have to make people feel any particular way what would be authentic in this moment 
And whatever would be authentic in that moment, whatever is real for you, that's the path to not being drained. That's the path where showing up from that place, we don't really have to do anything. We don't have to generate anything. We're just allowing ourselves to simply be. We're showing up to the world as ourselves and letting that be enough. And from that place, exhaustion, burden, burnout, overwhelm, all of that stuff slips away. We don't have to manage that anymore. So we don't even have to schedule hour long breaks afterwards because all we're doing anyhow is just being. And if all you're doing is just being, you don't really have to manage it that much. I noticed the video is breaking up a lot on my end too, Tommy. So I think I'm going to, it's very annoying. I'm going to try to come to this final uh, thing that Mike has uh, asked, which is how do we recognize limiting beliefs? And if it's really choppy, then we're just going to wind down today. Call it a day. Get my tooth fixed. So Micah's question is um, how he, very, very uh, simple. Actually, no, let's come back to what you've written first, Andrew. You haven't given me a clarification, so I'm going to do my best to kind of answer this. So you're saying when it comes to connecting with people, I, I interpret what you've written as like, it makes sense to sort of honor our time, you know, like I'm not going to talk at 1130 at night, but if I'm just connecting with someone, if I'm just having a connection conversation, it can be a little awkward if they're like, fit into my calendar, you know, talk to my receptionist and we'll set up a call to connect casually. And then you, people are like, that's crazy. I thought we were just going to chat. So there's no right answer here. You kind of have to choose for yourself what is and isn't going to work for you. These days for me, um, like I have people, friends sometimes who are like, hey, can we hop on? You want to chat, catch up? And I'm like, totally, I'd love to do that. And then they're like, but I don't want to, I don't want to have a thing in our calendar. Like, can't we just connect and, and do whatever? And I tell them like, I'm totally willing to meet you there, but I want you to know like that's, first of all, that's not how I just up to too much and I'm empowered by everything I'm up to. It's not like I wish I could just do that. I'm really clear. In order for my life to work and for me to hold and, and have the impact I'm committed to having in the world, I, I kind of I need to run stuff through my calendar so I can manage my time effectively. And I've got friends here in Canada, like in Victoria, that I'm reliable to meet up with, but like to jump on the phone, I'm just not reliable for that. So if you want to poke me and see if I'm around, totally, I'm down to do that. And if you really want to hop on the phone, what really works for me is let's get something in the calendar because then I can trust it. I don't have to worry about it and it allows me to be up to everything I'm up to. The second part is when someone doesn't know me, it's not a friend. It's like someone who's uh, who's like, hey, I really want to, you know, I want to hop on the phone with you. I'd like to know more about your work. I'm like, great. Well, why don't we connect? And you kind of, again, you have to see what's going to work for you. So Right now, my practice is full and there's a lot of people wanting to know about the forge and wanting to connect with me and know about working with me. And for some of those people, what I've been doing is a couple things. One, if I have a cancellation, I let them know I got a cancellation right now. You want to hop on the phone? Two, I'm really clear. Like, yeah, I would love to connect, but I'm, I'm really booked and I'm away on vacation and I just don't, I don't have any extra time would you be open to scheduling something out in December or in January? I know it's a ways out, but like, that's, that's kind of what I've got available. Um, so standing for that, because that's what serves me. And the consequence of that is that sometimes people are like, ah, and then they just go find someone else to talk to. That's okay. That's not an issue for me. If it's an issue for you, you might get curious about that. Like why, what is it that has that be an issue for me? Why is that something I'm worried about? Um, it turns out as you have a bigger and bigger impact in the world, more and more people will want to connect with you and you're just not going to be able to connect with all of them. And so again, right, we have to, I have to find that, that sort of place, just like everyone wants to talk to, or many, many people would love to talk to Barack Obama. He doesn't have time. And so you kind of got to, you got to work with that system. Um, okay. Yeah. That feed is choppy. I'm so sorry, guys. Very annoying. We're going to finish up with Micah's uh, question and then we'll, uh, then we'll wind down. Um, so recognizing limiting beliefs, Micah asks, how do I recognize limiting beliefs? The first thing we have to say here is 
Every belief is limiting. There is a, what's the word? Like pop transformation, pop leadership, pop culture kind of vibe that like some beliefs are great beliefs. They're expansive and other beliefs are limiting. Now there are, um, there are beliefs that are like, especially limiting, like I'm a worthless pile of garbage. And there are beliefs that might be especially expensive, like I can do whatever I put my mind to. But what's important is not to compare beliefs against one another, but rather to recognize every belief inherently is limiting. There is no such thing as a belief that is not inherently limiting because to believe something is to put a box around it. To believe X is to hold a degree of truth about X and that will limit the infinite abundance that's available as far as X is concerned. So if I operate under the belief of like, I can do anything under my own steam, great, that's amazing. Until what's called for is for me to surrender to the fact that I'm wanting to create some vision, some goal in the world that requires a team. And now my belief that I can do anything under my own steam is in the way of that, because I'm going to try to create that goal solely under my own power. And that's going to limit my ability to empower a team, to surrender to a team, to give up, to, to fall apart, to let someone else hold me, to shepherd me through all of that stuff is now blocked by this formerly totally empowering belief. So there's no such thing as a unlimiting belief or a belief that isn't limiting. They're all limiting. And we have to kind of, come to terms with that. Monica, what I am, are you saying that's the ultimate belief? Is that, are you giving an example of a, uh, and hello, Monica, by the way, everyone, Monica is going to be joining us in the forge next year. So keep your eyes on her. She's going to be uh, taking on some transformation. She's up to big things. Tell me, tell me more about what you've written, Monica. So every belief, every belief inherently limits us to some extent. That's not bad. That's not wrong. That's the trouble is that we relate to the fact that a belief is limiting as a bad thing. And now we've imposed another belief on it. And now we're reacting to this story about like, well, this belief's bad. So maybe if I could find the better belief, the non-limiting belief and so on and so forth. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks for this. <laughs> you do my heart well. I'm glad you're here and I'm honored to know you. So from that fact, that fact that we've got kind of all beliefs are limiting now, the real question might be like, how do I distinguish when a belief is currently limiting me rather than a limiting belief? How do I find out if a particular belief is limiting me? And the way we do that is we start to get clear on what we really want. That's always the first step. Kind of like if you asked me, how do I recognize the walls that, that are stopping me from moving forward. So first of all, every wall stops you from moving forward, right? Every single wall in the world blocks you. You cannot get through a wall. It's the point of a wall. So every wall is inherently stopping you from moving forward, just like every belief is inherently limiting. Now, having said that, the danger is then that we make our life about breaking down limiting walls or limiting beliefs. And what would that, that, what that would have you do is commit violence to people's houses, waste your time breaking down walls that are in places that simply don't matter, going after ruins, you, you get the idea, doing all sort of wacky stuff. And in fact, there's nothing wrong with a wall and a wall only needs to be something we take a look at when we have a destination we're trying to get to for which that wall stands in the way. So we have to start with getting clear on what we want to create. And to do so, we have to get really clear on like, what is the goal I wanna create that currently might feel a little bit impossible, a little bit outside of my capacity to make that happen. Yeah, someone else could do that, but there's no way I could do that. So the reason you have to do that is because then as you look towards that goal and think, what do I have to do to get there? that's when you're gonna to start to come up against those beliefs. So you're gonna start being like, okay, I'll use one of mine. Uh, the vision I have for the intensive, which is nebulous right now, the, the intensive is a little murky given COVID and I'm kind of like, Bay and I have some other stuff in the works and we're kind of like, oh, it's, it's gonna work, but we'll kind of go 
I'm reinventing that project, but we'll go with it for now. Given the intensive was 30 people in attendance last time we ran it, and the vision we have for it, the vision I have for it is 150 people twice a year. That's a big vision. And I want to create that over the course of, uh, I can't remember the last time I looked at this project, but it was probably about three years. So that's not linear growth. That's exponential growth. And as I set that goal for myself, as I sit down with my coach and start talking about it, all that comes out of my mouth is all the reasons why I can't do this. All the things I'm scared of. Oh, I don't want to do that because that means I'm going to have to like call up 500 people and make invitations. And I hate inviting people. And then they tell me no. And they give me these awful reasons why this isn't the work for them. And I'm like, I oh, know this is the work for you. Blah, 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 blah. And what do you know? We've just come up against a belief. The belief I have in this moment that in order to create 150 people at an intensive, it will require me reaching out to them and enrolling them. Okay, great. So we've got a belief that's in the way. Then I get to take that belief and put it on the table and start to look at it and see what I could shift, what needs to change, what I might create as a different belief that would empower me to step further into this project. So what most people do is they put the cart before the horse. They try to distinguish their limiting beliefs and then once they have that and move that out of the way, they think that then they'll create the big goal, which is a lovely fantasy because then creating the big goal won't have any of the fear attached to it because I've eliminated the limiting belief. But that's futile. It's quixotic. It's tilting at windmills. You can take on limiting beliefs for the rest of your life and never move forward in your life. You just keep tackling beliefs and then you get a new belief and then you get to keep doing that. And all of this saves us from our fear. It keeps us safe from doing what's really scary, which starts by making a declaration about a goal that we just cannot see how to create, but we really want. And we know it's not physically impossible. It's just currently impossible for us. From there, your limiting beliefs are going to come forward. Okay. <laughs> we have very few viewers right now. I totally get it. This feed has been really choppy. I'm going to take a look into it. Um, Big, big, big thanks to Andrew, Monica, Tommy. Who else can I give shout outs to? Uh, Sherifat, Vicky, uh, Heather, Sarah, Nuno. Thank you all of you for coming, stopping by. It's good to be back. And a uh, big thanks to people that offered topics. We had a lot, uh, I think, because we missed a few. So Micah, Sherifat again, Ernest, Maximilian, Vicky. It's so much more fun to take this stuff on in partnership with you. So I really thank you, honor, and appreciate the partnership. We are not back next Friday. I'll be away on a trip, but the following Friday, we sure as heck will. And we'll be talking to uh, Jared, who's in the forge with us. It's gonna be a really fun conversation. He's hilarious and delightful. Love you guys. Have yourselves a great weekend. Bye for now.